So if you're a creative type and you want to create a business out of it, you need to listen to our next guest, Steph Fontaine. Now, Steph is originally from the UK, lives in Switzerland today, and is the founder of a business called Collaborative Art and Team Building. Great story about how she turned her passion of art into a business that actually pays the bills and is extremely successful today. We covered her TED Talk in Zurich, which she did a couple of years ago, talked about her struggles of overcoming postnatal depression, how social media has become an extreme force uh, for her business and how she markets herself, and also her aspirations for the future in creating a portable business, which is going to enable her to run this from wherever she is in the world. Let's have a listen. This is the Expat Business Hero Podcast, and I'm your host, Alex Congdon. Hi, welcome, Steph. Hi, Alex. How are you? Great. Listen, great to have you on. And I want to start by having a bit of fun, if you don't mind. I've got some questions, some rapid fire questions, five stereotypes of artists. So if you don't mind, I'm going to ask you and you just need to tell me true or false. Or if you've got another version you want to tell me, then uh, are you good for that? Very good. Very cheeky, I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Steph, here we go. First question. All artists are perfectionists. A lot probably are, including myself. <laughs> really? Oh dear. Okay. Okay. So all artists speak and hear in colour. I I think so. Yeah. True. Okay. All artists are moody and emotional. <laughs> emotional, definitely. Moody. Maybe I'm just in denial about that one. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um. Artists are always broke unless they've just had a sellout. Well, I like to believe that is a myth that is not true. And the starving artist, I'm sure it does exist, but it doesn't have to exist. Okay. And the final one, artists always carry a sketchbook. I should do. I carry around a notebook to write down my ideas. I don't always draw them, surprisingly, though. You, see, you don't carry around, you know, you're not drawing buildings and people as you walk around, no? I don't have time to stop and do that. I'm so busy. <laughs> <laughs> of course, of course. Okay, Steph, I want to ask the first question then. So how did you end up here in Switzerland? I was working for DuPont for their European Human Resources Centre in the north of Spain, which is where I met my partner, who's Belgian. And um, he was transferred to the headquarters in Geneva um, for that company. And I quit my job at the time and they actually rehired me in Switzerland. And that's when I started learning French as well, because I had no idea how to speak French back then. And, um, and then happily ever after, if you like, we got married in Switzerland. Our son was born in Switzerland and that was our that was our first chapter in Switzerland that lasted 10 years. And then we moved to Miami for the kind of the same reasons, work, work related reasons on his side again. And so what was the, work. the driver for you for setting up your, your business? So um, it's always been my passion um, to paint art. And I kind of denied myself the opportunity when I was growing up. I decided not to go to art school, so, you know. I need to study something to get a proper job. So all these, you know, these internal voices were all confronted with. Um, mine were telling me, oh, no, don't do that. You can't make a living from art. So don't go to art school. When you've got a decent job, you can paint in your flat and, and, and live it that way. So I, I listened to those voices that were sabotaging my dream for years. And um, it was, I, so I started painting when I had my, uh, my second job, which was in Spain, and um, I was painting in my flat, and, and it became a self-funding hobby in the end, because friends would see my art and ask if they could buy it. And I've gone off your question. That, that's what <laughs> artists do. I mean, they go so, down so, the rabbit hole. All oh, right. So you, but <laughs> you're get, still... Um, you were still working at that point. You were still you were, you were doing this on the side, as it were. It was a, as a hobby. Yeah, so it was it was a hobby as well as a passion. And so the trigger for taking that leap of faith to to make a business out of it was um, after the birth of my son. I actually had a postnatal depression, 
And so during that phase, I was obviously seeing, um, getting some professional help. And it was a real moment to stop and reflect, where, where do I want to go from here? How can I find something sustainable that will make me feel good? But also, obviously, we all need to make a living as well. So I think what gave me the courage to do it is when you're at rock bottom, you, you feel like you have nothing more to lose anyway. Um, everyone from the, uh, I was unemployed because um, I ended up after six months of um, postnatal depression. I quit my job because I thought I didn't want to be in this limbo forever. And I had to take you know the bull by the horns and do something. So I quit my job with the idea to start my own business. So then in, this is when I'm living in in Switzerland um, there's quite a nice system in Switzerland or at least back then it may have changed now um, they put you on unemployment and when you go to your advisor on unemployment you tell them what your plans are they basically laughed in my face I said I want to become an artist and teach people how to paint so you see this very serious face looking up at you saying did you go to art school I'm like no no sorry didn't do that have you ever taught anyone how to paint before? I'm like, no, no, I'm self-taught. And, you know, I learned that way. So I'm going to share what I learned with people who want to learn how to paint. And, uh, you know, you can imagine what's going through their head. Can she even paint? So luckily I had my portfolio with me and I got that out. And that broke the ice because luckily, thank goodness, she, she seemed to like my art. And then she relaxed once she saw my art. But that initial response from the unemployment advisor was, you're having a laugh, aren't you? <laughs> <laughs> so once I got her to buy in on my crazy idea of uh, becoming an artist and teaching people how to paint, um, she set me up with, they send you to a different advisor um, who is specialised in um, entrepreneurship. And then they're the ones that put you on some courses in Switzerland on how to set up a business. So that's that was how I switched from corporate world um, doing art as a hobby, but loving it, having denied this voice in me for 15 years from sort of college and university time to having over 10 years of experience in the corporate world, postnatal depression, what am I going to do to turn my life around and enjoy life again? Because it was a dark place at the time. And now that you, was my sort of transition phase. Yeah. I mean, you, so you talk about some of these topics in your in your TED talk, which is a great thing. I mean, a lot of people just dream of doing a TED talk and you've done one. I think it was in Zurich. I think that's right. Why was it important for you to do that talk? And, you know, what did you get out of it? Well, it, this particular TED talk was a TEDx for women in Zurich. So um, I know men can go through depressions and burnouts as well, but I, I think a lot of women can relate to um, varying degrees of postnatal depression after having children. And and I don't know if it's because I'm British or it's society or what, but a lot of these subjects feel a bit taboo and people don't talk enough about it and we don't realise how much it is affecting people. And then even aside of postnatal depression or depression of any kind, um, it's, it's not only tough for the person to experience it, but all the loved ones around, that's, it's, it's really rough, um, unsettling times for everyone. Um, people feel helpless. They're, they're not sure whether to talk about it as well. This, you know, this uh, etiquette. What do we do? Um, so yeah, um, I'm someone who's quite transparent and um, like to put it out there. Even though I feel like I grew up with this British culture of "ooh, let's sweep it under the carpet." We can't talk about that, can we? You know. So you know, put it out there, but in a way, not playing on my own violin. Um, making a really sad story out of it yeah it was tough but to tell the story in a way I had all these big bumps in the road like we all do of some some kind um but to tell it in a way that I hope would inspire others to stop procrastinating or denying something about themselves and to to go for it to take a leap of faith and whether that's because you've always dreamed of climbing the Kilimanjaro or learn to play the guitar finally. Just, I mean, we don't know how long we've got. So we've got to give it a go. What kind of reaction did you get from the, from the talk? A, a very touching 
emotional response um, after, obviously, there was a round of applause, which which was um, always feels good, right, when you feel that something's been um, received well. But after the talk, there were so many women that came up to me, and some of them even in tears, that it had touched them and it sound, parts of it sounded like I was telling their story too. And I cried with them. It was so, I've never, from a complete stranger, I don't think I've cried and given them a hug within 10 seconds of meeting them. It was, it was really special. And I felt like it was so worth it to have put myself out there. I was terrified to go on stage. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I hadn't been trained for that. Um, I, it was a long process to prepare for it too. I had to script, I had to go through all their hurdles for them to approve my idea. And then you have to give an outline of what you're going to talk about. Then you actually have to give a real script. And I spent months not being, you know, trained in, in that kind of thing on editing, re-editing my story into a script. So I really, really appreciated what authors are going through because after a while, you think, oh, my God, my story is really boring because you're going over it all the yeah. time. And you think, oh, but this, this isn't even, is this story good? Oh, it's boring. I've heard it so much. There's nothing interesting here. Then you have to memorize it. And you're <laughs> how amazing actors are to memorize their lines because I, a lot of people thought I had prompts on the screen on the stage and there was nothing. All I could see was the the pictures that I was clicking on the sort of PowerPoint thing that come up behind me on the stage and being a newbie at being that I didn't do my slides in a way that would prompt my speech. They came after a certain oh, no. line in my speech and I was like, Oh, <laughs> so yeah, you learn a lot. So it was worth the pain and the sweat and the moments of doubt and the jelly legs I had standing on the stage. It was all worth it when, when those women were coming up to me saying that it had really um, hit, hit, hit a nerve for them. Now, many people think of you know, being an artist or think of art as a sort of solo, solo sport to say, but you've managed to use it as a medium to bring people together and specifically teams. So can you just tell us a little bit about that? So yeah, having a background in human resources and my mind likes to connect dots all the time. It doesn't stop actually. I'd like a button to turn it off sometimes. <laughs> so what I wanted to do was connect the business world with the art world. I've always loved um, anything in my roles that involve training, being a guru in a certain area and sharing that knowledge with others. I've always loved when I was in the corporate world. So, but the subject I was a guru in was not my passion before. So to be somehow an expert within an area of art and share that with others, that, that was what I was looking for. But how could I, my, my question was, how can I get it out there even more than just someone deciding I want to learn to paint? I wanted to go beyond that and get people to experience going out of their comfort zone like I was when I was on TEDx stage or any other challenges uh, we put ourselves through. I wanted to put teams through this discomfort as a way of putting them all in the same boat so their roles don't matter anymore. What's going on in the office in terms of um, who's the boss, that doesn't matter anymore. They're all there. They all, most of the time, perceive themselves as not being an artist, not knowing how to paint, not knowing how to draw. So you're, when you put them in this scenario, we say, okay, you're going to create the face of your organization in the style of, I don't know, some graffiti artist that you, you show them. And it's going to symbolize who, who you are as an organization. That's just one possible thing we, we might do. And they have to come together to achieve that challenge. So it's like they're all starting at zero. And then, so you've got them collaborating and uniting through that. But also what you do, you're, you're transforming their doubt into pride during the process of the workshop because when you tell them their challenge, they're thinking, oh my goodness, this is silly. This is going to look really bad. I can't draw. You know, these are the sort of thoughts they're having. And at the end, they are, at least to date, touch wood after seven years, I haven't had a team that has 
sort of not given this impression of being super proud as a team at the end of what they've created. It even goes the other way. There's kind of a lot of debate on who gets to hang it in which office or which <laughs> corridor because <laughs> they, they're all in, sort of in love with it and super proud. So this is the kind of turning that doubt into some kind of ecstasy is, uh, and, and using the magic of the creative process to do that. Um, I find that fascinating and that's what I've been working on. I mean, what, kind of, what kind of teams have you worked with? Have they been oh, office space teams? I mean, or... Yeah, you get a lot of um, global leadership teams, um, um, but it can also be a startup. We've done it with NGOs. Um, we, we do it with HR, sort of global HR. We've done it with mark, global marketing teams. It doesn't always have to be global. We've done it also in seminars where we did one, for example, in the US a few years back. And it was a seminar uniting 150 healthcare professionals from around the US. This was at the Aspen Institute in Colorado, the, the, the venue. And the organizers of the event wanted us to design something. They had three different things, activities going on in parallel. So they, our brief was, you're going to have 50 people, then 50 people, then 50 people come because there's other stuff in parallel. So that we want you to design something that the group A starts it off, group B is going to inherit it and take it further and so on. And then on the following day, when everyone's in the same auditorium, you're going to present what they've done and give a talk on art and inspiration and connect the dots between what they've done, the theme of the conference, which was um, consumer experience, I believe. And yeah, connect all the dots and give a pre presentation and reveal the masterpiece they've created. Because of course, group C saw the end product, but group A and B didn't. So there was a lot of how, what have they done? How have they taken what we started off and what they've done with it? And um, so it, it, those were strangers from, they all had healthcare in, 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 as their connecting point and they all had an interest in consumer experience. Um, the organizer wanted us to use art and inspiration as a way to connect to consumer experience. And so they basically designed a story on what they want to achieve as the content of the masterpiece. And that sort of united them all together in this vision for the future of the, the, the future of healthcare in the U S that, that was, that was what happened in there. So it, yeah, very different, diverse kinds of people can, can go on these um, experiences or workshops. Now, I mean, in addition to the public speaking, which is obviously a huge hurdle to get over with uh, when you do the TEDx talk, but what about the other fears that you've had to deal with as you were setting up a business? Can you tell us, tell us a little bit about them and you know, which ones and how you overcame them? Oh, fears and realities sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> yes, they weren't made They're up in your mind. One of the, yeah, they're not all made up in mind. So one of them, um, I said I don't believe in the starving artist, but obviously any business when you set out in the beginning is likely to have cash flow problems. Um, it takes time to build reputation. And my reputation was not really in the art world at that point when I started out or as a provider of um, team, creative team building. I was really starting from zero. Um, so yeah, cash flow was an issue, and I think in my s beginning of my second year, it must have been, um, I sold my car for about twenty thousand francs, I think, just to have cash flow that year. And then I was carless for a few months, which is not convenient when you're an artist of large format <laughs> paintings. But it forced me to cycle everywhere and borrow people's friends' cars when I needed to de deliver or buy materials. And I got great legs out of it. So <laughs> <laughs> I eventually, by the end, late, later that year, I had enough cash flow that, that the um, and uh, track record um, for my finances that I was able to take a, a, a car lease, but one that was at a much lower rate than the previous car I was um, using. So that was from my previous life, if you like, and I've never taken a lease that was that expensive starting out otherwise. So yeah, you, you, you find solutions. I mean, most problems do have some kind of solution. You don't always like what it's going to be. 
And then there was another period I, I took a part-time job, um, I, probably the following year, I think that was, because I always have this sort of number in my bank account where if as long as it's above that number, I'm fine. I have a buffer for, for cash flow. And it was getting seriously close to my warning number on my bank account that I thought, oh, you know, you don't know how long it takes to find a part-time job, so you better start looking now. And uh, my criteria was it had to be in the village where I lived. I had to earn at least this amount per month. Uh, I had to be with nice people and something that was easy for me to do so that I was not caught up using my mind at work, that I had the energy of my mind to develop my business outside of the job. And they needed to be flexible. So if I had to say, oh, I'm running a workshop that day, I can't come in that day, but, you know, it had to be a dynamic. And I found it within a month of looking and it ticked all the boxes. So I think it's, it shows the power of when you vis visualize what you're looking for, even though obviously ideally I would have liked not to have had a part-time job because if I put 100% of my energy into my business, I think you can get more done faster. But, you know, I was not feeling comfortable where the finances were at the time and that was, you know, the next best scenario. So I did that for a year, year and a half. And ironically, with hindsight, I think I would have made it without doing it, but it was my panic button that was triggered, and, and there we go. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I think it's actually a very valid choice for a lot of people. They, some people don't actually want to fully give up their work work. They want to do it sort of part-time and have a, a business on the side as such. I mean, it probably comes to the point where you have to choose, but um, I think what you, know, what you went through is very real in terms of other people's experience. So you have a business partner. Who I Uli, who's who who also comes has a I think a, a business background as well. So why did you choose to have a partner in your business? And is this something that you would advise others just as they set up their businesses? Well, mm, I wouldn't necessarily advise others to have because business partnerships can be very complicated. I, I I'm. I come from a family of entrepreneurs and I've seen my parents go through hell with partnerships when I was growing up. So in that part of my brain says, no, I don't advise it. But the part of my brain that says, or heart that says, yes, I do advise it is nothing happens in a vacuum there. So, but I would see it a collabor as a collaboration more than a partnership in, in terms of legality. Yeah. And collaborations, I think, are key to everybody's success. So how, how, how you figure that out um, on paper between, between those collaborators, that, that's, that's the bit I think people need to be careful on. Um, and I've come across some interesting potential collaborations along the way. And I think you have to be willing, when you, if you're, you have to be willing to listen to your gut feeling on them as well. I, um, so Uli, was like finding treasure at the end of the rainbow for me. Um, but I've also been introduced and sort of explored other collaborations with other people along the way. And you've got to be willing to listen to your gut. And I know on one particular occasion, I didn't, I didn't do it fast enough listening to my gut because I thought I had started something out and I couldn't sort of chuck it in. But I, I did in the end and you just have to explain respectfully to but this this is not working for me for X Y Z right so, yeah. and um, yeah so it's it's not it's not easy to find the right people to collaborate with but it's definitely an important if you find the, the right people that's amazing what can happen. Could you tell us then about the one thing a couple of things that you're most proud of in in your journey with with creating the business. There are a few big milestones that I'm really proud of. Um, one we mentioned before, it was doing the TEDx talk. I was sort of confronting my fear of public speaking, of telling a story that made me feel very vulnerable as well, but hoping that it would inspire. So that was, I'd say that's number one. I'll give you the top three. Um, number two was the 100 Faces Project. We haven't talked about that today, but that was in 2012, 2013. I took a year to paint 100 commission portraits with the idea to unite 
people and give them a sense of belonging to a project by um, commissioning a portrait of either themselves or a loved one. And it ended up being, the challenge for me was not only painting 100 portraits in a year, but um, confronting 100 people with an artist's vision of themselves. So, but that was a, it was really hairy at the end to meet my deadline, but I made it. So that would be number two. And number three is when I design um, workshops for really large groups, like over a hundred people. And um, uh, the, uh, there's a funny story about one I had to do in New Jersey when I was living in the US. Um, I had one for 125 people, I think, in New Jersey, in Princeton. And because of Hurricane Irma last year, all the flights were cancelled. I was basically bunkered in a house with hurricane shutters and I had to, they had to get another facilitator to come in to um, New Jersey to replace me. So I had to quickly train and brief one of my other facilitators to give that workshop whilst I was lying on the floor (laughs) with my laptop and Skype on. Luckily I have all the instructions and stuff on a PowerPoint for them when it's a big group. But that was that was a quite cool a challenge, and the reason that the client didn't want to cancel, um, obviously they understood that I was in a. They were very worried for me and my family, but they didn't want to replace the event with an, an alternative team building. Uh, they could have booked a murder mystery um, sort of event for 125 people, but they wanted it to be meaningful as well as fun and creative. And the fact that we connect the art experience with the business, that was actually the thing that kept us that job and why we had to think on our toes and and handle it like that. So I'm pretty proud of that as well. Yeah. So looking ahead then, what's what's in store? What are you planning for the future? What am I planning for the future? Well, I have put into place, um, I've licensed our team building concept. And I say our because Uli's the co-founder of that idea. Um, I have the mentality of anything is possible. And she does too, but she's more realistic than me. And she has this amazing capacity to simplify as well. So we're very complimentary. I'll sell, but when we design a concept, I run it by her and she says, have you thought about that bit there? How are you going to do, you know, so... Yeah, so she co-founded that. So for the future, um, I've already started licensing our team building concept to other facilitators. Um, It's sort of in, uh, I'm just doing it with one at the moment to, you know, work out any teething problems with that. Um, But they, they, I, I even was training them remotely using Skype and all of these tools when I was in Miami and they were in France. So I've trained a facilitator online. They've, I've sold workshops. They've gone to facilitate them. And so I'd like to see that scale up so that my, my, my dream is to be a creative nomad. No matter where I am in the world, I can make a living. I can still be on the end of the phone selling to a client and hearing what their needs are and sparking those ideas to design them a special workshop or painting in my studio um, but but making a living, whether I live in a teeny little chalet in the middle of the mountain in the middle of nowhere, I can send then these facilitators I collaborate with to go and run the workshops. Um, and I, I already transferred my website onto an e-commerce platform. It's my e-commerce platform. Um, so anyone who purchases on it is my client, not the client of Saatchi or any of these other platforms. And I just go down, I box, I protect the painting, package it up how it needs to be, go down to the post office and ship it. Um, when I travel, I'd like to paint on the back of beer mats, for example, and put them on Instagram, you know, the landscape that I see and people can buy and I just pop it in the post office as I'm tra- traveling, you know. So this this creative nomad concept where I can scale it up collaborate with others, but still be involved in the design creation of things and, and, and making a living no matter where I am. That's, that's my vision for the future, really. 
Well, you mentioned your website and I was going to end up by asking you how people can reach out to you. So you've got a couple of websites and a few social media profiles and I'll put them all in the show notes afterwards so people can link through to them. But the main one I think you've got is a collaborativearts.ch, which is your, your business website. And, and you're also on stephfontaine.com, uh, that's Steph with a PH. And then um, you're on Instagram, Steph Fontaine and Facebook, Steph Fontaine. So I'll put them all in the link afterwards and uh, show people how to, to reach you. But I just want to thank you very much, uh, Steph. I, I just want to recognize what you do. And I think, you know, your contribution, not just to getting people to come together, but also also inspiring people probably more in the creative industries that actually you can make a business and you can be successful and not just have it as a hobby that's, uh, you know, draining your financial resources. So I just think, you know, thank you for doing that for them. Um, and thank you for coming on the show. Thank you, Alex. It was a pleasure. Okay. Thank you.